Good evening, good evening, and welcome to The Breakdown. We are in October of 2020, 33 days from Election Day. We're almost there, folks. We're almost there. I am Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson. Tonight, we are joined by Lincoln Project co-founder Mike Madrid and award-winning journalist and author Kurt Eichenwald. But as always, we are taking your questions tonight. Be sure to tweet us at hashtag AskTheBreakdown. And you can tweet us some questions. We'll answer them. If you want to tweet us about things that are going on, questions about the state of the race, and questions about Trump's finances, because yes, that is still a thing. We are here to answer your questions. So be sure to tweet us at hashtag AskTheBreakdown, or you could go old school, my favorite, voicemail. Call us. Give us a shout out, 701-203-1208 if you want to leave us a voicemail, and uh, we may play it later on. So stay tuned for that, and we'll answer your questions in a bit. So here we are. We're almost four years into this Trump disaster, and we find our country in the midst of just an unmitigated shit show. It's a disaster. Predictable, of course, because it is Donald Trump. But we are living this every single day. And here we are, four years, and the facts on the table are 200,000 dead Americans, thanks to Donald Trump's failed COVID response. He's cost lives. He's mishandled this pandemic in a way that is inexcusable, absolutely inexcusable. And how anyone is still undecided after just that fact alone is beyond me. But here we are. The man who ran a casino, multiple casinos, into the ground, bankrupted casinos, which is virtually impossible to do, he did multiple times, is running our country into the ground. Again, predictable, because this is Donald Trump, and he showed us who he was as a failed businessman before he got elected, but here we are. He's the commander in chief of our military, calls our military men and women suckers and losers, He's a silver spooned draft dodger that has the audacity to speak ill of any of our honorable men and women who serve. And he's in debt up to his ass to God knows who. 420 plus million dollars in debt to God knows who or where or what country. He would be a national security risk in any other capacity if he were not the president of the United States. But some would say, like H.R. McMaster, that he is a national security risk. He is a threat. The decisions that he makes are not in the best interest of the country. And he's one of many. He was his former national security advisor, so he would know. Americans who are on unemployment because millions, tens of millions, have lost their jobs because of the COVID crisis and have not gotten them back and may never, they're on unemployment. They have to pay taxes on that unemployment. Those Americans will pay more taxes on their unemployment checks this year than Donald Trump has, the billionaire, years in a row. Just think of that. The Americans who are struggling right now will pay more taxes than Donald Trump has. That is unacceptable. How that's allowed in America is beyond me. But here we are. We all knew this, like I said, four years ago. But it bears repeating The president of the United States is a racist, a racist, unapologetically a racist. Meanwhile, what did we miss? Lincoln, how did you like the play? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, let's roll what we've missed. What's gone on meanwhile since we were last together? A new report detailing years of President Trump's tax returns. What could you tell us about that story? People don't understand what goes into a business.
lobbyists and foreign officials paid top dollar at Trump properties. And the president earned $73 million abroad. Including from countries with authoritarian leaders like the Philippines and Turkey. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups. Sure. What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. Supremacists and would right you like me to white proud proud supremacists Ooh. and right proud proud militia. Boys, stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left. If I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. And I'll tell and what, you what, what does that from mean a common sense, does that mean you're I'll going to tell, tell your people to take to it the It means you have a fraudulent election. Who did better in this debate overall? 53% say Joe Biden. At the end of the day, the votes will be counted, so don't be intimidated. Vote. <sighs> Never a dull moment. Uh, Tara, before we get too far along tonight, I want to jump to our favorite White House spokesbot, Kaylee Mendacity. She had a terrible, horrible, no good day. And it came from a from an angle in a sector she did not expect, her good friends at Fox News. Mm. Fox News Radio's John Decker this morning uh, asked her very blunt, bluntly about an unfounded comment she made last week about Do- Donald Trump asserting that ballots were found in rivers and ditches. and she just absolutely blew this question in ways that are almost almost unimaginable. Let's go ahead and roll that piece. The president has criticized the mail-in voting process quite a bit over the last few weeks. The other day he said they found a lot of ballots in a river. Who is they? Um, so the, what the president was referring to are um, something that we've seen just in the last seven days, where in Wisconsin uh, there were trails of May ending up in a ditch. I, that's, I believe, the specific he was referring to, um, and that included absentee ballots. We're, we're specifically in this particular statement, though. Who is they that found those ballots, and where is this river anywhere in this country? The local authorities. It was a ditch in Wisconsin that they were found, and I can get the article oh, to your inbox if you'd like. And beyond that's that, fine. If, if he misspoke, that's fine. No, so that's, he meant, that's he, he I meant believe a, he meant a, a, that's a, what the a president ditch was rather than a river. To. And you're really you're missing the forest for the trees here. The point is, I, know where, I, I like I cover the, the news, and is, I like to report accurately in the news. And when the president says they found a lot of ballots in a river, I simply want to know where the river is. No, you said simply want to ignore the fact of the matter. I Again, I got asked so many questions about respond. this in my, fo- my Fox respond. affiliates. Where is this river? Allow and me I can't to give them an accurate you. information. Allow me and to that's respond. why I'm asking you. This is this is what is happening here. You are ignoring the problem here, which is last week in Pennsylvania, you had ballots found in a ditch. That is a fact. In Wisconsin, seven military ballots, all marked for Trump, were found cast aside. There are problems with mass mail-in vo- voting. I under, I actually don't understand the lack of journalistic curiosity in reporting on this. There used to be, the there used to be curiosity. Where's in fact, the, the Washington Post, before President Trump uh, highlighted the problems with mail-in voting, they said the result was an unexpected stress test of mail balloting systems when this was tried, many of which were designed to handle only a small portion of the vote and are not ready to scale up in response to the pandemic. So the media once said oh, no mail-in reason. voting is not ready to scale up in the middle of a pandemic. Now there's no journalistic curiosity there's when we're no finding Trump asking you about it. cast aside. There's no journalistic curiosity when a hundred I'm asking you where the river is and you can't give an were sent out if, you, if you say the president uh, were made a ditch, ballots and then, then the ballots and more. I just Shameful want to know where the river is. <laughs> Lack of journalistic curiosity. I'm very curious. Where's the river? Yes. That's curiosity. Uh, Senator Tim Scott. Uh... Take me to the river. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she was on the struggle bus that entire question, and it's it was just, glorious. Yeah, you know, this is going to go down as one of those like one of those press secretary moments where you know the, the you could hear like the tick 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 in her head of the gears turning trying to get out of the question and then she falls back to the well you have no journalistic curiosity i'm sorry kaylee the last time i checked you weren't the assignment editor so right and yet and yet there's more kaylee also and tara i think you're gonna love this clip tara because it just it, it <laughs> continues with it with the greatest hits parade this week of donald trump and his administration defending white supremacy we need a musical bump for that guys let's roll that piece <laughs> 
If I could start off, um, I'd like to ask you for a definitive and declarative statement without ambiguity or deflection. As the person who speaks for the president, does the president denounce white supremacism and groups that espouse it in all their forms? This has been answered yesterday by the president himself, the day before by the president himself on the debate stage. The president was asked this. He said, sure, three times. Yesterday, he was point blank, blank asked, do you uh, denounce white supremacy? And he said, I've always denounced any form of that. I can go back and read for you um, in August 2019 in one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. In August of 2017, racism is evil, and those who cause violence in its name are criminals. And including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups. I have an entire list of these quotes that I can go through with you. He has condemned white supremacy more than any president but, in modern history. Just to clear it up this morning, can you, naming it, make a declarative statement that you denounce, that the president denounces it? I just did. Uh, the president has denounced this repeatedly. The, the you, president was asked this. You're you just, making, you're contriving a no, storyline and a narrative. I'm just asking you to put he this said, to rest. I just did. I read you all of the quotes. And if you need quotes, to see them in writing, I will put them in an email. Hold on. So, Haley, can you right now denounce white supremacy and the groups I that just espouse it? The president has denounced white supremacy, the, the KKK, and hate groups in all forms. He signed a resolution to that effect. Uh, the president just last week, perhaps you all weren't covering it, but just last week expressed his desire to see the KKK prosecuted as domestic terrorists. This president uh, had advocated for the death penalty for a white supremacist, the first federal execution in 17 years. His record on this is unmistakable, and it's shameful that the media it's shameful that the media reports the actual words Donald Trump says. How dare they? <laughs> All the humanity. Right. You know, the, in Politics now, 101, a rule is if you're explaining, you're losing. When the freaking white supremacist groups are printing T-shirts with the exact quote of the President of the United States because they believe that he is sending them marching orders, that's not condemnation. So this is asinine no, what they're no trying to do. They're, like the American people are stupid. We're not stupid. We see what goes on. Nobody cares that Donald Trump read a hostage statement after he screwed up a couple years ago after Charlottesville that said he condemned white supremacy and hatred in all forms. He didn't, he didn't mean that. It was, it was CYA at the time, and we all know it. His actions sure. when he's unscripted speak the truth. The guy has, right. is, is simpatico with these bastards, and he has made it known. And that is the end of it. And now, finally, people are, have had enough, I think, I hope. Uh, even the Republicans, even Mitch McConnell today, had, for God's sakes, had to come out and condemn what the president said, even though it was pretty weak-kneed after, following after Tim Scott, who gave a, you know, well, I guess it was yesterday, who gave another weak statement. Right. Oh, maybe he misspoke. He didn't misspeak, Tim Scott, damn it. And you Never don't. misspeaks. No. That guy, look, the truth is always in the asides. Anytime Donald Trump is on the prompter grinding through, he's just making license plates, okay? Exactly. And then we will, da, 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 da. but when he looks yeah, to the terrible. side and says, I'm great, I'm the biggest, I'm the best, and also those brand people who will kill you. That's the real Trump. That's always that's the right. real Trump. And that's the impossibility that's of the Washington press corps position right now. And it's fascinating to see even Fox News putting daylight between themselves and this White House. Because the honest the, what John Roberts, there. right, what John the Roberts did reporter. after this, I wish we had that clip, but what John Roberts did after. He walked out and did a absolutely fiery condemnation yes. on the on on the drive in front of the White House, basically saying they need to stop lying. They need to just do this. This is the easiest thing in the world to say we condemn white supremacy. Instead right. of going and saying, well, on April 18, 2017, if you'll check paragraph 72 of a speech the president read at the teleprompter, um, no. And, and look, the, the, the last couple of days have been a, boo, a bull market for the white mats and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the boogaloos and all these other idiots that are out there. And mm -hmm. the Proud Boys are run, ironically enough, by a goddamn Canadian. And as we pointed oh, out today, yes. if, if Gavin, what's his name, Gavin Innes? Gavin, McInnes. Uh, McInnes. McInnes. If Gavin McInnes was named Ahmad or Mohammed, he would have been thrown out of the fucking uh, country because he's trying to build a goddamn lily white terrorist organization. So with that's that. right. And and we and <laughs> but we love the Canadians. 
So, you know, I guess every I country the has their bad apples. The Canadians are the nicest people. When I found out that the guy was actually Canadian, I was like, maybe they kicked him out. <laughs> That's right, why he's right. here. Maybe he's part uh, of the yeah. maple peril. <laughs> right, right, right. But the sad part about this Lord. before we bring in our guest is that these groups are more than just rejects that are wannabes. They are indeed right. violent and they are they have a proclivity for violence. Um, and our law enforcement agencies, our federal agencies have identified these groups right. as a domestic terror threat. So as much as we make fun of them as a bunch of insecure jerk offs, they're actually uh, they do pose a threat, not just the Proud Boys. Not, you know, it's others, it's Boogaloo's, the three percenters, it's, it's the Oath Keepers. Um, I encourage yep. people to read the article in the Atlantic. It's a long form article about the Oath Keepers, another uh, one of these groups who yep. I had no idea about that are recruiting law enforcement and military folks. These are trained people on weapons and they believe that there, there's going to be a time when they need to take up these arms and they believe it's for Donald Trump. These people are parading around. Who, who are they, you know, pledging their allegiance to? What flag are these militia groups carrying? It's a MAGA flag. It's not even the United States, yep. you know, America flag. It's not even the American flag. So this is scary, crazy stuff. And Donald Trump is is uh, playing with fire here. And, um, you know, more Republicans and, and those in power need to speak out against this because this is not a joke at all. And, and guess who else uh, is not a joke at all? Go ahead. <laughs> no, go, go. Let's roll. Let's roll. Let's bring All right. Guys. All right. Well, We'll bring in Kurt, bring in Kurt Eichenwald into this conversation. He's an award-winning journalist, best-selling author. He literally wrote the book on how not to run a business. Uh, he wrote the book, Conspiracy <laughs> of Fools, <laughs> Chronicled the Lies, Times, and Ineptitude Behind the Enron Scandal. And uh, Kurt is going to be our guide tonight and break down Donald Trump's taxes and what a god-awful businessman Donald Trump is and how he's running the country right into the ground. Kurt, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I've known Trump since 87. Uh, and the oh, very first time I spoke to him. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> and the very first time I spoke to him, the very first sentence he said to me was a lie. You know, it was, it's, it's never changed. It's never been different. And I'm very, um, very rich. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's, it's lie clear. Lie one. Yeah, well, it, it was clear from the beginning. I mean, all I, all I wrote about for 20 years was business and finance and scandal and Wall Street scandal. And um, this guy was the dumbest businessman I ever encountered, bar none. And everybody who had any dealings with him would come away and say, no, 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 he's an idiot. And, you know, this, this is his big problem is that all this stuff he does about I'm the smartest person in the world and I know everything and blah, 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 blah. That's real. You know, he, he really he believes, believes it. Knows. Oh, God, yes. Um, I mean, there was a... Oh, when I was hurt? A, because he's mentally ill. Because oh, this guy... Oh, this, this, is, this, is, this is the thing that people still don't get about him is they will say um when he got elected i told my boss here's what's going to happen and i've been pretty much on target i didn't predict covid but i did predict that whatever disaster right. would come along he would just deny it existed unless he could you know bomb it he'd love that um like hurricanes. but yeah I mean, think of think of hurricanes. His oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying. In the times we had this sort of non-monetary pool, where the bet was, is it an act or is he crazy? And I went with it's an act. And then I had a meeting with him in his office where he basically had a complete breakdown in front of me. And I over came what? back and said, "What was it over?" I have no idea. It was, it was, he, I was just asking him some challenging questions. And right. it was right, it was after his bankruptcy started, it, it, one of his bankruptcy, and everything was coming apart. And I was there with one of his, uh, I mean, I wrote this in Newsweek, so I'll tell it. I was there with one of his, with him and one of his big guys. And um, we, he just suddenly started making absolutely no sense. He got up and said, well, we're done, and got up and left. And I was sitting there looking at this going, what 
happened? And the guy who I was with said, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah. And he said, do you, I'd like to ask you, this is the biggest mistake I ever made. He said, I'd like to ask you not to report that, what just happened. I was like, what just mm-hmm. happened? And oh no, the argument he made was the guy doesn't have a public company. He's not, you know, all he is is a marketing thing. The banks, the banks own his assets. You know, he's not in politics. You know, I don't need to publicly humiliate. And uh, fool that. And that was one of his executives. That was one of his executives. And he, and I said, you know, what did just happen? And he said, the thing you don't understand about this rings in my ears forever. The thing you don't understand about Donald Trump is that he's mentally ill. That he's mentally ill. Mm-hmm. And luckily, he now has control of seven thousand nuclear weapons. Yay. Yeah, isn't that great? And and the, the <laughs> nature, the nature. I mean, you were talking about about uh, uh, what's her face, mendacity today. Yeah, and Kelly. the nature of the problem. This is a guy who number one is stupid. Number two, thinks he's brilliant, not only thinks he's brilliant, has to believe he's brilliant. He cannot believe in any circumstance that he isn't the smartest person. Number three, cannot be corrected. Look at what she won't say with the whole river and ditch thing. All she had to say was, right. oh, he misspoke. He meant, he meant a ditch. Right. Right. She can't, she can't say it. Ditch. She can't say it. Right. Because if she says it and she goes back, he will be throwing things. I didn't misspeak. There was a river. The hurricane was going to hit Alabama. I want everybody. That's what that was. He can't. He accidentally tweeted Alabama. And rather than just saying, oops, he had to get all of the gears of government operating to cover say his he was right. And when the map didn't match what he wanted, the map was wrong. Let's break out the Sharpie. I mean, all of this stuff is predictable. And so when you see him, you know, blowing up at Biden uh, during the debate and saying, um, uh, and interrupting constantly, being killing, smart. His mic right. yeah, killing his mic isn't going to do anything. He's been challenged. Somebody said something bad about him. He is physically incapable of not lashing back because how dare you look at what happened when he said, you know, whatever it was, Biden said, that wasn't smart. You guys caught mm-hmm. it. the no, react, yeah. the two, the two worst things yeah, we that did. Trump can handle. One is smart and the other is loser. Being broke or being and broke. Think, broke is okay because he's able to argue I'm not broke. People just don't understand this. Mm. And you know, <laughs> the reality—he's not though, broke as long as he doesn't believe he's broke, right? As long as he's, he's not I broke, he still has more checks I'm... in the checkbook, right? Oh, he, you know, he gave a he gave a deposition once where he's being asked about the values of his, you know, his yeah. net worth, and he starts talking about the values of his assets, and they ask him, you know, well, who's valuing them? He says, I am. I was like, okay, well, what's what's the current value? He goes, well, it depends on the day. You know, it depends on how I mean. It depends on how I feel. That's how this guy's a businessman. This is how he made that decision. COVID will go away because he said it would go away. Therefore, it will go away. He's going to win the election because he said he's going to win the election. And if he doesn't win the election, someone will call him a loser, and that can't be true. That's why I think the period after November 4th until January 20th is going to be the biggest threat this country ever faces. Uh, I to say and, that uh, you're not, you're, hey, Kurt, you know what, Kurt? You're not the only one who said that. The FBI put out a threat assessment that said the same thing this week. It was leaked to a writer for the nation. And they, that's exactly what they said, that they're concerned that the threat matrix b- between um, election day and inauguration is uh, high and that we need to be huge. on the lookout for it. Yeah. But yeah. The, real, the really bad part is going to be after December 14th, where if the Electoral College is able to meet 
and Trump has, you know, can't stop it somehow. The Republicans haven't figured some other way to right. try and turn us into Belarus. Uh, and <laughs> if Biden won, um, after December 14th, he has December 14th to January 20th to make America pay. And yep. that is what he'll do. You know, you I, again, I don't compare Trump to Hitler in terms of his, uh, you know, he's going to run off and do the Holocaust. I compare Trump to Hitler in terms of his psychology. And one of the things people don't remember about Hitler is that when the Russians were invading and it ended up that it was inevitable that they were going, that he was going to lose, uh, that Germany was going to lose. He ordered, sent out orders to start destroying things, to start destroying German utilities, to start blowing yep. up roads, blow, not for the purpose of stopping the Russians, because, and he said he wanted to punish the German people. And it was only because Albert Speer got involved and said, don't do these things and countermanded right. the orders that it stopped. Trump, after December 14th, if there's nothing left for him to do, all he has is rage. And that rage, you know, he's letting California burn because they didn't vote for him. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine what happened. Yeah. And so I don't know what he'll do because I can't think like him. Nobody can think like him. No one can. Meant well, and nobody's I, I, I saying this, Kurt. It's always a danger to compare anybody to Hitler because obviously Hitler had normal sized hands um, <laughs> and, a, and a complete attention span. But in regards to that, so you you sort of had a forensic. Yeah, I just mean eye. in terms of the way he thinks. In terms of the way he thinks. <laughs> yeah. You had a kind of forensic <laughs> eye into Trump's business dealings for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that an underreported aspect of Donald Trump to this day is the influence of foreign powers over him, not only on the debt side, but on the aspirational side where Trump wants to expand his properties globally because the Trump brand in America is basically dog shit and has been for a very long time. The Trump brand in, in the Philippines or in Latvia or wherever else he was thinking about building a hotel has been a lot more sustainable. So uh, I'm curious if you have any insights on that, because I know you, you've looked at some of the overseas shenanigans of Trump world. Yeah. Well, one of the big things, you know, to, to link in the whole foreign side of it, one of the big things you have to, to do is understand the horrifically perilous position he's in right now. And I'm not talking about like in four years when debt comes due. I mean, today. And, you know, this guy, as usual, he, he doesn't understand that, you know, if you own a building, it's not the same as owning cash. And that building has to be producing cash in order for you to expand. Sure. He has had, going through the time story, he has had roughly... $520 million in losses. Um, and that is every golf course, his hotel in Washington, his, you know, his total corporation. So that means there's nothing that's pulling him through. And that cash bleed, you know, he has all these borrowings, all this money he's borrowed, and it's way more than $420 million. The 420 sure. million is what he personally guaranteed. You know, there's hundreds of millions more that are not personally guaranteed. And to pay those, he needs cash. And if you look at what he's been doing, he took out a $100 million second mortgage on Trump Tower, which is his only really good asset. Uh, he sold a $100 million worth of stocks. He pulled out, I think it was $98 million uh, from a partnership that he could get cash out of, but lose money. This is a man who is draining down his cash, draining down everything he can get his hands on that he can be paying interest, paying the interest with. But sure. Interest is due. <clears throat> They're down to $34 million of cash at the Trump Board. That is. You can't even do. You can't even do debt service on 
on no. $400 million with $34 million. You can't even do debt no way. service. On that. And so you have to look at, well, what else does he have? Well, he's already borrowed $100 million against Trump Tower. He's already, he's already sold most of his stocks. He's already pulled his money out of a partnership. He's running out of pockets to pull cash out of. So now, if he misses an interest payment million bucks, that creditor can throw his entire enterprise into involuntary bankruptcy. And by enterprise, I mean- Delicious. Delicious. So it's gonna be, it's, mm-hmm. so it's in delicious so long as he's right. not in the White House. Right, well, that which too. is what I was about to say. Um, you know, there's uh, the, the idea that he is going broke, basically, and that it's the, pre- it's the presidency that's propping him up. You know, he had his daddy to prop him up before. He doesn't have that now. The Russians propped him up after that and continue to in their own way. And now he has the presidency to prop him up. And then after November, if we have anything to say about it, he won't have the presidency anymore. Um, doesn't this make him a national security threat? I mean, Miles oh, Taylor told me, told me that the national security staff, the majority of them, were worried about Donald Trump's behavior because he was making decisions that were not based on the best interests of the U.S. They were on his business interests. And that's why he was cozying up to these dictators, because it's easier to do business in these corrupt countries with a handshake and a, and a, you know, and a slap on the back. And that these and are the people that are going to rescue difficult- him. Yeah, you don't have the difficulties of democracy and disclosure. Correct. That's what I mean. I, I knew when he was going in that his biggest buddies were going to be the dictators, because he was going to get angry that, um, you know, like Germany wouldn't go, oh, yes, you're so brilliant. Oh, everything you want is true. Uh, I said something really stupid on uh, actually on MSNBC once when he was engaged in this sort of, uh, uh, you know, rocket man, dotard back and forth with uh, King Jong-un. Right, Kim Jong-un. With Kim. Yeah, and I said, you know, the biggest thing is if, if Kim Jong, Jong-un understood Trump, he would just start throwing on the praise and writing him love letters and telling him how great he is. And within a day, Trump will start giving him tours of our nuclear facilities. I was close. <laughs> you were close. <laughs> you were close. Instead, he gave away and, a, a, a movie about uh, how wonderful North Korea could be if they have like a Trump property and resort there. <laughs> but you know if, if we end up in a second term and that million dollar shortfall comes along you know what his mm-hmm. what this this happened in the late 80s uh where trump castle what his one of his first casinos right uh was gonna was gonna miss a bank loan was gonna miss an interest payment on a bank loan and he was not allowed to borrow money to pay so Here dad, comes daddy. daddy Trump, he bought the daddy bought Trump, three point something of chips, right? Mm-hmm. He got his he got his lawyer to walk into the casino with a literally a suitcase full of money, walk up to the to the teller, give him the money, take the chips and leave. And so he laundered Unbelievable. millions of dollars, which got caught. And ultimately, yep. and you know, it was a violation of the bank of the bank. And ultimately, you know, the Trump Castle had to pay a fine for money laundering. <laughs> and so, you know, when when so Daddy now is Putin, and you know, anybody in Saudi Arabia, the Middle East is going to be his piggy bank. Uh, Azerbaijan, Turkey. You know, all of these places know, they know what he is, and they know what's at stake. And so the boys, no the boys way. basically right now, I mean, it seems to me like the boys are the bag men right now. They're going around the world pretending to do these deals. They're, they're, they're the bag men at the moment, is, is my read mm-hmm. on it. But, I mean, so, Kurt, let me ask you this question. But they have to get him cash. If they of don't course. get him cash. You know, right. I mean, imagine you've seen what Trump will do to avoid saying I was wrong about the hurricane. Imagine what he'll do yep. just to stop Trump Tower from becoming Bloomberg Tower. You know, <laughs> oh, my God. That's the reality that we're talking be... about. 
amazing. Oh, so, so but, but I mean, Kurt, a, a lot of people have speculated, and I, I think we've come to the conclusion right now, the winning the presidency again is probably the only thing that stops Trump from bankruptcy. And this time, there won't be a greater fool lender out there. And once he's out of the White House, uh, suddenly I'm guessing that Putin and others are going to stop returning his phone calls. Um, that's the thing. I don't know how Putin works. <laughs> so, well, um, he's not useful yeah, anymore. Like, no, no oh, more value the proposition. Question, the big issue, and it's one that's a huge issue, is um, Trump retaining his security clearance. Because there's never been a president who's had a security clearance block, and a wow. former president. And you know, if Trump retains his security clearance and he's There's heading no towards missing the loan, you know, uh, uh, and everything coming apart, I could 100% see him resorting to espionage. Just not thinking. He's just like, oh, I'm smart. I'm, you know, Biden is mishandling the United States. Let me go off and do whatever I'm going to do. You know, let me say and- this right now. There is absolutely mm-hmm. no way in hell that if Biden wins, that they will allow Donald Trump to keep his security clearance. No I, freaking I can't way. There's no that way. Is, by the way. That is, by the way, a tradition, not a law. And that is a tradition Correct. that I, well, I know. broken I know. immediately. But, you know, Fox, <laughs> Fox will go nuts and you oh, know, well. ultimately, boo-hoo. Um, and, you know, but ultimately, I mean, you have to look, for, I'll give them for, exa- for an example. Um, In Azerbaijan, he was trying to do a deal, fell apart, as always. Uh, He was trying to do a deal with a fellow who was the son. So, and he knew this, the son of a guy who was laundering money for the Iranian, yeah, for the Iranian revolution. Of course, of course he was. Yeah, of course, right. And he knew, he didn't care. And the number of people now from other countries who are, you know, from the Philippines, from Brazil, uh, who are people who have done business with Trump, who are now in government positions doing work with the United States, it's horrible. It's it, it, What's so pathetic about all this? is, you know, Trump, I mean, why is Trump going off and risking the lives of everyone who comes to his thing, his, his events? Because he needs the adulation. He has to of have course. it. And, yeah, and of course. And just, he, he will think, well, they won't, they won't have a price. So you ask, oh, they'll be fine. Why? Because I say they'll be fine. And if they get and sick, he's a malign- well, right? And he's a malignant, narcissist, sociopathic, selfish bastard. So he doesn't care about anybody else's life but right. his own. And his, that's, his, and- mind, his mind can't go the two steps of no. well, if they get sick, I don't, you know, I don't care about it. His mind is they won't get sick because this is my event. I mean, he said that in the past, like, oh, my events are safe. Why? Because he says right. so. You know, and if he says it, you know, if he says it, that's it. And he said the ballots are are what they are, and he said that if he loses, it's fraud. That is not going to change ever. No, you know, reality so distortion have- field. Mm-hmm. Am I making you all happy? Oh, <laughs> Absolutely, hey, could not be yeah. happier. You know, here's what I, I, I'm just glad, Kurt, you didn't say, actually, it's all an act. He's a devious mastermind. <laughs> he's no, all he's of you. <laughs> no, he is, he is the dumbest, uh, you know, I mean, actually, one of the things that's interesting is I, back when he was saying, you know, the economy is great, let's cut interest rates. You know, those are two diametrically opposed things. If the economy is booming, you want to raise interest rates. Make sure you don't get inflation. And he was like, let's get the market to 10,000. Let's do this. And I was just saying, that's a sign of how stupid he is. He doesn't know the relationship between interest rates 
and uh, and uh, uh, the economy, which could be true. Of course not. Of course but now not. that well, I know, no, how much debt, now that I know how so, much uh, debt he has and how much he's been selling off his stocks, he hasn't sold them off completely. He needs the stock market to go up, and he needs interest rates to go down. You know, this is his personal finances that are at stake. I had a conversation with a former White House official who was in a meeting with Trump and a number of other folks on the financial side one time in D.C. in, the, in 2017, and they were trying to explain to him how the Federal Reserve worked. And it was <laughs> apparently like trying to teach calculus to a cow. Yeah. It was just, I mean, just absolutely not. They, they, they simple pictograms, colored blocks. They couldn't do it. Uh, he's just he not. Is. He does not understand anything except his own peril. Anyway, oh. Tara, go ahead with your. You had another segment coming up. Oh yeah, I just wanted to bring in Mike Madrid into this conversation because it's. Uh, you know the state of the race and what's happening and the impact of the of the subject matter that we're talking about. Uh, is something I know that our, our our viewers are curious about since this story about his taxes broke on Sunday, I think. And then we had the debate shit show on Tuesday. Um, and then we have the white supremacy footsie game going on again this week. So the tax story kind of got knocked off the front pages, but I, it's still relevant. It's not going away. And it's pretty serious, What you know, the accusations going on here. Um, Before- but Mike, go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. No, uh, before we dive too far into the the tax story, can we roll that asset with the uh, the new edition of the of the Lincoln Project Youth Adventure book series? <laughs> I got it. It's the Trump boys and the mystery of the $70,000 haircut. <laughs> oh, my, by David Dennison. I saw that. <laughs> right, <you got> <laughs> oh, oh I, I spoke to John Barron. Oh, you really? of course you did. Nice. Oh. Nice. Did you know it was him at the time? Let me tell you, Donald Trump is the richest man in the world, as well as being the richest. <laughs> I I actually, I was I was not a hundred percent sure until at one point i said you know you sound exactly like your boss and, and what did he say forget what he said. He said, oh yeah i heard that a lot and i was like okay yeah this is and yeah, I he hears it a lot why, i was like why are you doing this it doesn't make because he's sense. mentally ill <laughs> because That's... he's because he's mentally ill um, Mike Madrid, you are not mentally ill. You're a really smart and well-adjusted adult, which is why we all love you. Um, <laughs> Mike, and those stories about a happening? killing spree in the desert back in 94 are completely yeah, false. Right. No, never happened. Never happened. Never happened. Can't prove it. Mike, I haven't been in that basement for years. Right. All right, Mike, what, what is happening? We see that there's pencil, there's movement. We have poll numbers. Um, you know, Joni Ernst is losing in the Senate race in the latest poll that we saw, shockingly. Uh, what's going on in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Texas? We, we'll talk about Texas in a minute, too. But what is happening, my friend? What is happening? I know it's heartbreaking. <laughs> it's kind of hard to hear. But look, normally in a race like this, and because it happens in most races, you start to see some solidification of undecided voters. There have been remarkably few as we've discussed for a long period of time, this is historically the most stratified race uh, in the history of modern polling, right? There's just not a whole lot of movement. However, we are beginning to see some breakage, not just amongst undecided, but actually with core uh, Trump base. And again, I never thought that we would see this, but at least for the moment, we can kind of you know, pontificate and kind of speculate as to why it's being created, but we are seeing movement with non-college educated white voters males specifically, uh, although women are moving too. And it's having an effect in places where you would probably not suspect. As you mentioned, Tara, Ohio is now very much uh, a race that is in play. Now, look, let's be honest about this. Lincoln Project, since day one, we always thought we would build a roadmap around Ohio to get to 270. 
But we got to take a good look at this, right? I'd like to think it was probably begun by the Goodyear ad that Rick put out there when the president made his misstatement about, or, or, or not misstatement, his statement about closing the damn Goodyear plant and shutting down manufacturing jobs. But look. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, whoops is a big one. The most averages, most polling averages have Ohio and Biden in about a plus three position right now, okay? This is not a state that uh, that Biden really has had any uh, even outside chances of kind of taking a serious look at, but he has now moved a very significant buy into the state of Ohio. We uh, op uh, uh, began Operation Grant a few months ago, so we've got infrastructure. We will be stepping up our efforts in Ohio. Incidentally, Donald Trump pulled his ads in Ohio 72 hours ago. Uh, he also pulled them in, in, uh, in Iowa. So at the same time that he's going dark as the campaign runs out of cash, we're seeing this movement of voters that we never felt that we would actually be breaking into with the Trump base. Iowa was a plus nine Trump state in 2016. It's now sitting at a plus two, plus three position in either the Seltzer poll or the morning consult poll. This is a very big move. You're also seeing Ernst down three, okay, Senator Ernst. We've, of course, played there as a Lincoln project. We visited Joni Ernst numerous times. We may want to look at that again, depending on what Rick Wilson's uh, workload looks like with the ads that he's got designed for the country the next 30 days or so. But look, it's a very real thing. Iowa Don't worry, is I'm absolutely... making most of it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Iowa is a swing state. Iowa is a swing yep. state. Ohio is a swing state. They are both in play. They're both in play for the same exact reasons as this demographic is moving, okay? Now, is it part of the fact that the COVID spike is happening in this part of the country where it has not really hit yet before? Possibly. Is it because all of the federal relief has been dried up and now the economic impacts and the economic devastation right. of the shutdown uh, uh, um, is actually finally hitting? Possibly and or probably. Is it the cascading effect of all of the stuff from the Atlantic Monthly stories, the talk about our veterans, to the, the tax stories, to the Woodward stories, to the debate debacle. Hopefully, I mean, something's breaking the fever here. And the question only remains is, is it something that is a short-term bump or is it gonna be a longer-term trend? The fact that the Biden campaign has moved into position in Ohio and Iowa though, tells us they're seeing the same things that we are seeing. They're taking it very seriously. They're moving on the offense. It's a very aggressive position in both states by the Biden campaign. The Trump campaign is going dark. So even if it's an outside chance, strategically and tactically, it makes sense for a stronger uh, offensive in both Iowa and in Ohio. You know, Mike, we've been talking this, about this a lot in the last few days, but there are very few places on the map, in fact, I can't think of one off the top of my head, where the numbers are moving to Trump. I mean, we're seeing increasing right. tightening everywhere in the country. I mean, we've got South Carolina with Trump only up a point right now. In, or in tied point. somewhere, on the, and right? The, and, the average, and the average in South Carolina, I think Trump's only like three and a half on the average. I mean, we've got Georgia tight. We've got Texas in such a panic that our buddy Greg Abbott, you want to, can you tell us about that today, Mike? <laughs> yeah. yeah, first of all, let me just say, Georgia's, Georgia's moving into a, into a good Biden position, okay? Black yeah. voters consolidating. Mike, Mike Espy is real in Mississippi. That is a real thing, yep. okay? Keep your eyes open on Georgia and in Mississippi. Things are happening. Stuff is moving, okay? But Texas, look, te and, and Rick, you, you, wise counsel, I mean, we, we, we've been talking about this since April, right? And we've yep. always been talking about this conflict between our experience in a race saying it's Texas, okay? It's always fool's gold. Take a look at right. the data saying one thing, come back and tell me next month if it's looking like it's close. Come back and say, it's looking like it's close, but it's Texas. I mean, you and I have been having this great debate it's as to whether literally you, you follow. April. Yeah, it was this April. It's like, do we follow the data or do we follow our experience? And the truth of the matter is that they're both kind of like, we're 30 days out going, man, the data is still saying that there's a play there. We're just so used to Texas not being in play. But look, folks, if, if we don't know whether or not Texas is in play, Governor Abbott knows that Texas is in play because he's shutting down and consolidating right. voting centers in numerous yep. counties by, by allowing just one uh, vote early um, um, a ballot place in in counties with millions of people, okay? Not only that, but the rumor is, and it's a pretty good source rumor, he may actually close early vote down, yep. by shut it down by a couple of weeks. You don't yep. do that unless you're afraid of people voting. 
That's why you do that. That is the only reason that you do that. You add on the fact that Ted Cruz has says this is a battleground state. So it's not just us that's speculating. It's not just our experience and not just our data that we're looking at saying this is real. The Republicans are saying this is real, okay? They're literally trying to use the infrastructure of government to shut down and suppress vote because it is that high vote turnout that will ultimately turn Texas blue. And it's looking more and more, pro it's a possibility. I'm not gonna say it's a probability, but damn, right. the data keeps breaking the same way that it's been breaking. It's that has been given us that look in the rearview mirror. That Texas car keeps getting closer and closer and closer to us, Rick. And at some point, we're going to have to make a <laughs> damn decision you, and pull the pull the you know, trigger or not. And I don't know where we're at, but brother, I'm going to have to rely on your judgment on this one because you know when we, we just, when we started Operation Grant in uh, in Ohio with our other allied groups, people thought we were crazy, and we moved the ball in right. Ohio meaningfully, yeah. over and over again. Everything we test, we know what's we know what's moving the numbers. We know what's working. We may have to just about we may have to, to buckle down the next couple of days and launch Operation Sam Houston in Texas because <laughs> um, if Greg Abbott is panicking like this, it is coming from up top. It is coming from the from the from the Trump campaign telling him you better bolt this this state down because if we don't have Texas, that's the ball game. It's over. There oh, ain't no it's path over. back. That is the end of the end of the line. And if that happens, it is done. So, folks, you that's may like, hear some more about like, Operation Sam Houston in the next couple of days. Yeah, just, just, yeah. Just let's operate. let's saddle up, Rick. Let's saddle up and ride into Texas. You you win <laughs> Texas, and you you break the back of you you crack the spine of of the Republican Party. Not just for twenty twenty, yeah. but you're going to have twenty twenty four candidates who are going to have to answer the question: How do we win Texas back? Okay, like right. that's how, how we, serious it won't just this be is. How do we win, win Ohio? It'll be how do we get Texas? How do we win Texas? If you're in that right. position. It'll be a lesson to Republicans of how badly Donald Trump was a cancer that consumed the GOP. Not well, you know, they had the sugar high, but they've lost seven hundred seats in this country. State house. Well, State it's going to be it's it's going to be like what happened. It'll be it'll be like what happened under Barack Obama, where the Democrats lost a thousand seats in states, you know, mm -hmm. in state houses across the country, and they lost a yep, record number of years. governorships and all of that. Um, you know, and it'll go the way if if they keep this up, Texas will go the way of California. Where Republicans used yep. to have yep. strongholds in California, now you can't find a Republican in elected office in California, or hardly at all on a local level. Um, and the demographics in Texas are changing rapidly. And Texas was one of the places where a bunch of Republicans who represented suburban areas, uh, you know, outside of the urban areas of D Dallas and Houston, lost in 2018. Yep. That's the reason why they're scared to death of what's going on there. I mean, just to put it in perspective, Harris County, which is basically Houston, is huge. There's four and a half million people there. It's larger than the state of Rhode Island. They used to have 12 drop boxes for early ballots. Now it's down to one. It is 70 square miles at its widest point in Harris County. So you're telling me that it makes sense to them that they're trying that, that the excuse, the bullshit excuse they're using is for ballot security. When they were offered to Such have security horseshit. at each ballot box, you know, each ballot depot as an alternative, so that more people should could you know could drop off at different places, and they're like, no, 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 uh, we're just going to have one. If it, that is just clear and obvious voter suppression, I, I, and obvious. I think it just represents this. Is, this is happening in a lot of states. I think this represents a rising tide of panic that is about the failure in the debate this week, the absolute collapse of his support in the Senate right now. Those guys, even even in the Senate, they're saying, oh, white supremacy, Donald, you gotta say the word. <laughs> I mean, they're right. nervous about it, but they're speaking, it, they're actually putting their names to quotes, which is astounding. <laughs> but I think it has to do also with the fact that Joe Biden is absolutely destroying them financially. I think that's a yes. big factor yeah. here. Record breaking again. Another record breaking month for Joe Biden. While you know, while Donald Trump is going broke and going dark in places because they don't have the money for it, Joe Biden is raking in the dough. Record setting. That tells me that the enthusiasm gap that they're talking about that's BS too. Because people don't send money to a candidate to set records when they're not enthusiastic or pissed off enough about the other person. But the point is that they're activating, they're doing something about it. So if you're sending, if people are sending money like right. that. And they're going to go and vote too. And the Trump campaign 
is, you know, they're they're concerned about this. It's clear because of look at how they're freaking out and what they're doing. Um, let's let's take a couple tweets and then we'll bring Kurt back in to, to have right. some fun with us. Since Kurt and uh, Mike are buds too, uh, let's throw up a tweet. A tweet and see what we got tonight. What about Texas drop boxes? Is the Lincoln Project going after them and mobilized to get ballots to the election board? That's from Carol, Carol, B-S-A-B. Um, are we going to go after them? Rick, are, are, what are we going to do? We just I just brought it up. We were Look, talking about uh, the drop boxes. Uh, we're, 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 we're in conversations tonight with a number of, of it, groups and individuals that are probably going to be in there litigating this very quickly. I think you will see either the Lincoln Project or our sister group, the Yellow Project Yellowstone, uh, invest in this in an attempt to make sure that we have the legal uh, fight, the quick legal fight with, with Greg Abbott. Um, this is an absolute abrogation of people's voting rights. It's, a, it's an absurdity. You can't justify it by mechanical problems or anything else or COVID. This is something we're going to be, be very aggressive about. And of course, you know, look, we're going to be an ongoing organization, folks. We're going to be here. We're coming back. So you, next time you decide to run for something, if you're backing this bullshit, there might be a knock on the door. You never know. So, hey, Kurt, we, you're in, uh, Kurt, Kurt's in Texas, right? Yeah, there's stuff yeah. happening here that that that's really fast. I mean, one of the, in fact, if this guy runs for governor, I hope you guys will back him. Clay Jenkins, who is uh, the top county guy in in Dallas County, and he's been yeah, yeah, yeah I know the name. Yeah, great guy. And he has been pointing out elements of Abbott's little order here that the, the single drop box, it's not actually a box. These are, they have to go in to a- right, That the party can go in, in, right? Into an oh, office. Oh, not a drive up. Oh. Yeah, and you'll have, um, uh, you know, according to this, you have to have two people from each campaign and Jenkins are saying is saying you are exposing, you know, the people who are working here who have to take these ballots. You are exposing them to COVID, and they are right. terrified. And I'm assuming he's heard it from them. But you know, that's an element here that isn't that might not be you know caught outside of Texas. Is that? Uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> is is that? Um, um, they're increasing the chance, they're increasing the fear factor to, to cause it's, it's really clear is if you go into, you know, if you drive across Rhode Island um, and get there that you can ultimately um, be exposed to COVID. Right. Cause are those people gonna be wearing masks? Probably not. Uh, no, we already know yeah. that. Yeah, so it's, that's why I say it's, a, it's, a, it's clearly a voter suppression effort. The, it should, the opposite should be happening. They should be expanding the ability for people to vote safely, not contracting those options. It's just, right. uh, it's obvious. And how many other governors who are in Donald Trump's pocket in red states are going to pull this kind of shit? So I hope that with the record setting $360, 70000000 million that the Biden campaign has raised in the last month again, uh, that they're investing in lots of election lawyers because they're going to need them. Because I have a feeling a lot of this is going yep. to be litigated and, and Trump, they're going to try to do this on purpose. All right, what sure else is. have we got? We got some tweets. Do we have a voicemail tonight? What's happening? Another, we have a voicemail? <laughs> what do we have next? <laughs> what do we have next? And everybody, thank you so much for your really creative and patriotic work. My name is Carol Mitchell, and my question is, I haven't seen any of your ads pointing out the fact that the reason the president tilts forward so much is he's wearing heels, and it's the same reason he couldn't get down the ramp. I mean, women know it's hard to get down a ramp in heels, so along with all the other phoniness, he's really not even as tall as he ah. looks or <laughs> says. So that is my question. Why have you not included that? Bye. I love the voicemail. I, I love voicemail. I am not an expert. You, <laughs> that was a good one. That, that was an A tweet. plus voicemail. You know, yeah, you, you can't capture that in a tweet. Like, Why haven't your ads addressed? And I'm thinking, what haven't we talked about? Do, do, do. Right. And it was, I wasn't expecting that. You know, Donald Trump, the, those little kitten heels he wears on his boots. Um, I, I, when, he, when he stands forward, he leans up. I refer to him as Pudgy the Centaur. 
because he just looks absurd. <laughs> oh that's my him. god! That's there it that's, is. You know, there he's got to be the tallest guy, and so yeah. he has yeah. to wear it. Too bad he can't do anything about his little nubby hands, or else, believe me, he would. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they called him right. the first figure in Bulgarian, because they knew the, the Spy Magazine did that in the 80s, because it drove him nuts. Kurt, that, that, is, that is one of the great gifts that Kurt Anderson has left our, our, our civilization, is short-fingered Bulgarian. One of my favorite <laughs> phrases of all time. All That's right. great. Any more, do, we, do we have another tweet, guys? What do we got? Social fly, hello, girl. Okay, do we have an even bigger national security risk since Kushner and Ivanka were given security clearances in spite of reservations by intel authorities, and you know none of them kept this stuff to themselves? Well, the the intelligence yeah. community in 2018, um, what there was a there, that there was a hot set of rumors floating around that Jared Kushner was making extraordinarily broad requests for various information, particularly about nations and leaders in the Gulf. In the Persian Gulf region. Mm -hmm. And the reason he was doing that, it was inferred, or at least implied, was that he was after intelligence on how to like leverage these folks to, to get money for his family business. That was the predication, apparently, of some of these requests. Um, you should never specifically trust for the Kushner. property specifically for the property on Fifth Avenue. Correct. The six 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 Fifth Avenue. Um, you know, I wouldn't trust Jared, Jared Kushner with access to Wikipedia. Um, so again, he's another one of these people who is going to end up with a, uh, with, with some questions to be asked at the end of this thing. And unfortunately he will know some of these things. They will be in his head. Um, but these, yeah. these people are, are not just a crime family. They're, they're like a spy ring. It's, it's unbelievably dangerous yeah. for this country's security. Can I say something about that too? Um, so Jared Kushner is probably one of the biggest security risks in this, in the white house next to Donald Trump himself. Um, not all, let's remember that during the transition, he was trying to establish a back channel to Russia going around our national security apparatus. Also, he is best buds with um, the uh, Mohammed uh, bin Salman over there in Saudi Arabia. And he was taking trips to Saudi Arabia um, around the time he was reading the presidential daily brief. The presidential daily brief, the PDB, is one of the most secure documents in the government. It has the daily, uh, you know, terrorist uh, threats and really top secret stuff. And only a handful of people have access to that. Jared Kushner had access to that and was reading the president's PDBs more than Donald Trump was. Um, shortly after he started doing that and went to and went on his trip to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman jailed, if you guys remember, a couple of years ago, he jailed a bunch of his perceived political enemies to consolidate power over there. He had people like Hold Up and a Ritz Carlton over there in Saudi Arabia and was uh, disappearing people. Um, that also came around the time when there was the blockade with Qatar, uh, after Qatar turned down buying out Kushner's um, financial right. problems in 5666 uh, Fifth Avenue. I mean, the list is long with things that Jared Kushner has done. And there was a, I, a many stories about how it was, the, the, secu the intelligence community was very concerned about Kushner having a security clearance. And one of Trump's yep. cronies in the White House pushed it through. This guy had no experience in the personnel office that does this, but they put him there so they would push through the security clear clearances of a bunch of the Trump cronies that would never, under a normal, uh, Trump, a normal I mean, administration, get security clearances. So it is a major problem. Huge. This is Huge. this is one of the reasons why there's never going to be a Trump library, because those people are going to shred a lot of documents on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, or, or gonna, no one's going to pay for it. <laughs> Who's he going to raise the money from? <laughs> there's that. I just don't. I think the paperwork is going to be sorely missing. Um, oh, I, I remember this. Is, they, they, they have to basically act things out in a tableau vivant for Donald Trump for him to understand them or use little <laughs> like animated figures to show him things. So that's going to be hard to have that in the presidential library. Mm -hmm. So I think we have right. some breaking news tonight, actually, as we are continuing Let's, on talking about this White House. Go um, on. I believe that someone very close to Donald Trump, someone that 
Anthony Scaramucci told us was one of the only people on the planet to see Donald Trump's Darth Vader helmet head when he is uh, before he does yes. his hair. Hope Hope Hicks has tested positive for COVID. Hope Hicks. Oh. It has been reported tonight that uh, she has she was on the plane on Air Force One with Trump. She traveled to the rally in in uh, Minnesota and is now COVID positive. So I'm assuming there are some. She was on Marine on One. White House. She was and on unmasked. Marine One with him. Unmasked. Yep. Are we? What's next? Are we taking some more? Uh, some more. I think we should take some more. Questions? Take some more. Uh, ask the breakdown. Let's go, folks. Throw it at us. Is Trump pulling ads not only because he doesn't have the money, but to spend the remaining money on fighting the results of the election? Mike Madrid. Thank you. I think most of it's going to. I think most of it's going to debt service to pay back the Russians. But yeah, I, look, I'm sure part of that, that's where most of it's going. Look, um, there's a whole apparatus and infrastructure that has been built up for this, and we're seeing a lot of this activity in Pennsylvania. I think Pennsylvania is going to be a very problematic place after November 3rd. He's already made the call to the Proud Boys and to militias to show up and start being poll watchers when they don't have the ability to do that. It's just not open to anybody who decides they want to be a poll watcher to give access right. to the ballot counting process. Right. Um, but you're starting to see the legislature behave funny. Pennsylvania, all of their counties have tremendous leeway on the way that they operate. Curiously, shockingly, most of this militia calls are to go into Philadelphia. I wonder why that is. Um, mm -hmm. But that's you know, going to be a very big I can't imagine part. what that could be. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine why. But I, I'm sure there are some resources going to that. Um, look, the, the objective here is just as much chaos and undermining the election as it is trying to win at this point. They're trying to stay close where they can. Uh, we, I think we're pushing that further and further away from them. But they're going to they're going to put up a fight. This is not going to be just a okay, you know, let's just we we lost, let's walk away. They're going to go down with their you know even you know nail scratches in the chalkboard on the way out as they're being dragged out of the classroom on this thing. <laughs> Okay, this is not yep. going to be pretty. We're going to have to be vigilant. We're going to have to be focused. We're going to have to be determined. And we're going to have to just stay committed to the goal here because I do believe that the first three weeks of November will be amongst the most volatile in our country's history. We've got to be prepared for it. He's not going to just slink away. He doesn't have the capacity to do that. That's right. I want to say one other thing about, about media buying. This is one of the few businesses in the world, there is no credit. There is no credit whatsoever. It is cash on the barrel head right then and there, money or nothing, put up or shut up. And so the idea that they're running, that they're going dark in these states and trying to reallocate that money into other states is, is very telling right now. Mm -hmm. Because they announced a few months ago that, that in the October window, they'd be up with something like $300 million with the media. Right now, That's they're up right. with about $79 million with the media, focused right now primarily on Florida and Ohio, um, and of course, Washington, D.C., that vital swing state where they have to keep running <laughs> ads because Donald Trump gets his feels hurt when he sees a Lincoln Project ad. So it's... Um, well, it, I'm happy to report that uh, Mike Madrid will appreciate this. Sunday, when I was watching football, I was watching South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> South Carolina. South Carolina. Stinkins, okay. And um, there were a bunch of Biden ads, and they were really, really good. So I was happy to see mm. that running there. So that's good. Well, the football report right. and political commercial update for yes. Sarah. All yes. Yes. Well, you know. Now, now Trump's just going to get that hundred million. You know, he's got thirty-four <laughs> million. Cash, but he's going to kick in a hundred million. Well, I mean, wasn't Kurt, there a story knowing, where they were talking knowing about what you that? know about Kurt? Kurt yeah, knowing he, what you know about Trump. Big, you know, Knowing what you know about Trump, and I want to do two things. First, first to frame this out. Tonight, it's, under, it's been reported that Brad Parscale was telling friends just before he was arrested that he was under so much stress because he's under federal investigation. Um, but let me ask you this. If Donald Trump looked at the billion dollars of money from his, that his campaign had raised, how much of it do you think he would steal if he could get away with it for his own uses? I mean, and still All operate the campaign. If he could All get away with yeah. it? All of it? Sure. All of it. Right. He's a, he's a, I, he's I a, suspect, yeah, his, I suspect his, there's going to be a big, big 
they gave this money for me, you know, uh, and, but no, I, I really am going to be very interested to find out um, uh, how much of this money went into the pockets of the family because, you know, they're a whole thing. I mean, the only thing that I love about all this is someday Eric and Don Jr. and all the rest of them, they're going to be on the hook for all of this. <laughs> and you know, they can only grip so long. And I really, 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 really want to see them in bankruptcy court going, <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> They're not going to have the Don Jr. is going to tell the bankruptcy judge, I need an allowance every week for $50,000 for unnamed reasons. Oh, my <laughs> God, Rick. <laughs> when Trump, Rick Wilson. When Trump went to bankruptcy he, got, he told the court and got a $450,000 a month allowance. Yep, that's right. That's but he had to sell his yacht. He had to sell his yacht. <laughs> and, I and I interviewed him. I interviewed him about that because I was doing a story about that. And he mm -hmm. said, well, you know, I guess it would be wise if I tried to cut back a little. Oh, yeah. It was his idea. Unreal. It was all his, it was all his yeah, it's, idea. Yeah, it was his idea. He did it. He was the responsible yeah. I, one. All I right. can tell you that, well, the, I, uh, that the inauguration committee is also, that's been under investigation for quite some time now because that type of money is less regulated than campaign money. And the inaugurate, the Trump inaugural fund is full of corruption and grift. And God no, only knows where a lot of that source money came from and where it went and who got it. So between that right. and the campaign, oh my goodness gracious, I can only imagine um, what will be uncovered eventually when the, the, you know, the boot is off the necks of the Department of Justice folks once we kick Bill Barr out of his ass too. Um, right. I think we have a call to action on that. How do we boot call Bill Barr out of his ass? <laughs> folks, we want to keep By every, voting. You know, as, as much as we can in the coming days and weeks, we want to make sure we share with you election information and tonight we have some resources for folks here and overseas, courtesy of our good friend and Lincoln Project Senior Advisor, Michael Steele. The U.S. Vote Foundation and their overseas vote initiatives serves U.S. voters at home and abroad. Yes, and you can find them at usvotefoundation.org. And their biggest uh, initiative is overseas vote. Um, they give access to voter information and they give the ability to engage in the democracy here in America, even if you're overseas, but you're still an American citizen. So we appreciate Michael Steele for uh, bringing that to our attention and those efforts because it's important. Every vote counts um, and it, it helps you through the absentee voter process as well. When you're overseas, it's a little bit different. Um, and they have a personalized voter help desk if you need help too. So usvotefoundation.org, you can check them out if you need to and you're overseas. All right. What else have we got, Rick? That is, we have got, um, uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up pretty much. We have an folks. ad? I, I think Mike we have an ad, though. Oh, we have, we an, have ad. an ad? Yes, folks, we have an ad for you. Let's roll focus group. Project is responsible for the content of this advertisement. <laughs> oh, the sad part about um, that is that I actually watched after our post debate oh, uh, show I you did. <laughs> on Tuesday. I had to write a, a post debate opinion for CNN.com, and then by the time I was done with that and going through the editing, it was like two thirty in the morning. And then I was like, you know what? I'm wired. I'm wide awake now. Let me watch Frank Luntz's focus group. So I did for 45 minutes and I watched the actual reactions of those people and heard them say those words and, and describe what they saw. And it's fascinating to listen to real American voters in real time reacting to Donald Trump's behavior. And it was, um, it was something not good for him. 
not Not good good. for him. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I think on that note, do we are we gonna do one more question? One more tweet before we go? Let's do one more question and then let's uh, head out into the into the cold night. All right. <laughs> are the rumors true? Are these really the leaf lands or the Trump's presidential library? Anna von Twitland. Thank you, you are for ending this night. Anna von Twitland. You are a gem. <laughs> a gem. Fantastic. Oh, that's great. All right. On that note, I want to thank our guests, Mike Madrid. Thank you, my friend, for the report. We will see you next week. Kurt Eitenwald, right. thank you so much for your insight on Kurt, everything Donald Trump right. finances. Pleasure to have you. Good night, gentlemen. Rick Wilson, take uh, us also, out. Also, folks, please check out our sister show, Vote for America, hosted by our good friend Jennifer Horn, uh, streaming on our Lincoln Project YouTube channel, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays at 1.30 East Coast time. We will be back here Monday night at 9 p.m. with our guest, former Republican Congressman David Jolly. Don't miss it. It's going to be a great show. Uh, We'll leave you tonight with a clip from one of our recent uh, Lincoln Project podcasts. And the subject is the Senate race in Arizona with the great Lucy Caldwell talking to Ron Stesla. Mark Kelly over McSally. Um, Lucy, how should we be thinking about the Senate race in Arizona within the context of the whole Senate and, and the presidential election there? Well, first of all, Martha McSally is just a complete train wreck of a candidate, and she could <laughs> not be less attuned. There's repeating. <laughs> she could not be less attuned to her audience. She is like a masterclass in someone going to Washington and hiring staff who maybe one time went to the state for spring training and just have no clue what they're doing. So her strategy has been to go all in for Trump. And that is turning out to be a really, really stupid strategy. And so in addition to all the aforementioned stuff about how Arizonans are quite comfortable with voting for people of multiple parties on the same ballot and quite comfortable with mavericky uh, candidates. They also, you know, she at the same time, her whole shtick has been, I'm this uh, female fighter pilot. I'm a fighter pilot. And then poor thing, she finds herself running against an astronaut. American I could here. stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. I'm okay? smart. I'm like a smart person. Trust me, I'm like a smart person. Winning! Winning! Fake news! Pillar! Pillar! Call me! Call me! can fix it.
The Lincoln Project. Thank you.